Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is Michael Armbrust, and I'm here from Databricks. I'm here to talk about functional query optimization in Spark SQL. Uh, so just to get started, let's, uh, let's first start by describing what exactly Apache Spark is, for, for those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, let me just take a quick survey of the audience. Who's familiar with Hadoop? OK, that's kind of what I figured. So good. So uh, you know, Apache Spark is a fast and general computing system. It's completely interoperable with Hadoop. That means you can read data out of HDFS, or you can reuse the input formats that, you, that you've developed. Um, but the key difference here is, uh, kind of in contrast to Hadoop, we've improved the efficiency by leveraging in-memory computation primitives. And what this means is that it can actually be up to 100 times faster than your kind of typical Hadoop jobs. And we also allow you to express more general computational graphs. So this is not just map and reduce. It's actually general DAGs of computation. And the nice thing here is that actually gives us speed ups as well. So it can actually be 2 to 10 times faster, even if your data doesn't fit in memory, even if you're, you're kind of keeping that data on disk. Um, another key difference is in contrast to kind of the very simple map and reduce APIs, uh, we actually improve usability by having richer APIs in both Scala, Java, and Python. Um, and we also support kind of an interactive mode, uh, which is kind of the, the benefit of being 100 times faster, is instead of writing programs, you can actually just sit down in the shell and write commands against Spark. Um, and kind of the, the nice thing about these richer APIs is for most tasks, it actually ends up being two to five times less code than, than in your typical Hadoop system. So Spark is, is kind of a general computation stack, is the way we like to think about it, where Spark is kind of the, the lower layer, the, the operating system of doing data science. And on top of that, we've built quite a few primitives. Uh, so we've got Spark SQL, uh, we've got Spark Streaming, GraphX for kind of graph computations, and MLlib, which is a, a library of primitives for doing machine learning. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about all of these different engines today, um, but I'm going to be focusing on Spark SQL. Um, however, before we kind of dive into Spark SQL, I want to start by going over kind of the, the Spark computation model and, and exactly how that works. Um, so when you write a Spark program, what you're really doing is you're describing transformations on distributed data sets. And the core abstraction here is what we call an RDD, or Resilient Distributed Data Set. Uh, an RDD is a collection of objects. Uh, it can be stored in memory or on disk across a cluster, so it's partitioned on all of the nodes, and we kind of co-locate the computation with, with the storage. And what you do is you apply these parallel functional transformations on this data. So think things like map or filter or reduce. Um, and I think kind of the, the key here is since it's running on so many machines, you're often going to have failures. And what Spark does is it hides those failures from you by keeping track of lineage and automatically rebuilding uh, the, the transformations when machines are lost. So like I said, this is, this is more than just map and reduce. Uh, we actually have a pretty, pretty general API. Uh, since you guys are probably Scala fans, you're probably familiar with a lot of these functions. It looks a lot like the Scala collections. Uh, but the difference is we kind of automatically parallelize all of these functions over the cluster uh, where, where your data is stored. So to, to dive in a little bit more, let's actually look at an example of what it's like to use Spark to, to do a kind of a typical t big data task. Uh, let's say you're a web company and you have you know, terabytes of logs spread out across the cluster and something's gone wrong. Uh, you want to kind of scan through those logs, look for all of the error messages, and then search for various patterns to try and figure out what, what the problem was. Uh, so what we can do is we've got a cluster here. We've got the driver node, which is where your Spark program is actually going to run. This is going to kind of control the computation. And then we've got a bunch of worker nodes, which is where the data is stored and where the computation is actually going to be processed. So we'll start by creating our, our initial RDD uh, using the Spark context. Uh, so we start by calling the text file method. What text file does is it takes a directory full of text files. In this case, we're loading it off of HDFS, but you can also load this data off of S3 or another parallel file system. And what this is going to do is it's going to return to us a collection where each line of these text files is an element in the collection. And so this is going to be the base RDD. So this is kind of going to be uh, you know, the, the initial data set that we're going to be working with. And now we want to do a transformation on it. So we'll start by filtering out any of the lines that aren't describing an error. We don't care about all the debugging stuff or the tracing stuff or just the info messages. We only want the error messages. And so now we've got a transformed RDD. 
And a key concept to Spark is that at this point, no computation has happened. All we're doing is building up the lineage, and the creation of lineage is lazy, which allows us to do better optimization when you actually ask us to perform an action. So now that we've got that, we can actually go through and do some kind of more complex processing on it, something that's not just filtering. So we want to actually break this up by tabs and take only the second item, which is going to be the, the messages in this example. And so now we've got a collection of all of the messages for all of the errors. And we know that this is something we're probably going to want to look at multiple times, since we are probably not going to figure out the, the pattern that we're looking for the first time. Uh, so we can call messages.cache. This is, once again, a lazy operation, but what it's doing is it's signaling that when we compute this RDD, we want to persist that data in memory so that we can scan over it again more efficiently and not have to load it from HDFS again and do these other transformations on it. So now I can actually perform an action. So I'm going to pull out all of the messages that contain foo, and I want to do a count. So this is actually this is an action. It's actually going to fire up a job across the cluster to compute that count and return the answer, the, the number of messages that contain foo. Uh, so what's going to happen is we're going to load up all of the data that's going to be spread out across the cluster. The driver is actually going to take all of those functions and serialize them and ship them to all of the machines in the cluster where they'll be executed in parallel. And so we actually read the data off HDFS, provide the transformations, uh, and then return the results. But since we mark that messages uh, RDD is cache, what we're also going to do is we're going to keep all of the messages stored in RAM cached around the cluster so that we can read them again more efficiently. So if I go back and perform another action, so this time I want to find bar instead of foo, um, we're going to once again serialize that closure, ship it out to all of the machines. Uh, and this time we actually read the data from memory instead of, uh, instead of from on disk. And so the results come back. And the, the key idea here is since we're able to read that data off, uh, off of memory instead of disk, you can do things like do a full text search of all of Wikipedia in less than a second. And this isn't using an index. This is actually scanning through all of the data. So you can do kind of complex transformations and filters that wouldn't be possible with an index. Um, and you know, this, is, this is versus 20 seconds that it would take on the same cluster if we weren't reading from disk. So what, what the, the caching primitive gives you is the ability to really interactively explore data in the REPL, which is very difficult with traditional big data tools. And even if, you, even if you scale this data up, so let's say we've got now a terabyte of data, something much larger than Wikipedia, you can actually still do interactive exploration in you know, five to seven seconds, still the, the amount of time that you're willing to sit there standing at the REPL. So, I talked a little bit about fault tolerance and kind of what that means, and I, I said that what we do is we track lineage. And so, you know, here's another example of, of a Spark program. In this case, we're going to find all of the uh, records where the, the, the if, we, if we count the, the number of records for a given type, it occurs more than 10 times. Uh, so let's say, so we've done this computation, we've, we've actually computed it down, and we've got, we've got our data set here, but then we have a failure in the cluster, so we lost this machine. What Spark can do is it can actually remember the lineage of how we calculated this final partition. And so if we ask for it again, what it's going to do is then actually recompute just that partition, uh, reusing the rest of the data that is still available on the cluster. So this is a, a Scala conference. Obviously, I should talk about you know, how, how Spark fits into the, the Scala ecosystem. Uh, and one of the questions we get quite often is why we chose this crazy Scala programming languages. Most of our users come from, from the Java world. They ask, why, why Scala? And you know, it comes down to, I think, a couple of things. I would say the biggest is these concise serializable functions. Scala was one of the first languages to make this very easy to do, and this kind of key to the, the Spark abstraction, that you don't have to write these like, large classes with lots of boilerplate, uh, similar to a MapReduce job, uh, but instead you just write functions which we can kind of trivially serialize and ship out. Um, I have to give a quick plug here, though, because there's actually a lot of problems with serializing Scala functions. People often grab things that aren't serializable and then run into runtime problems, and Heather Miller is doing a lot of really cool work on spores, which she'll be talking about in this very room at 5 p.m. today. Uh, so we're very excited for those improvements, which will actually turn these runtime serialization errors into compile errors and be much clearer to the user what, what's going wrong. Um, but another, another key feature of, of Scala is its interoperability with the Hadoop ecosystem. So this means that we can use the input formats, we can read from HDFS, uh, and so I think that's kind of one of the, the key things that made Scala a big success for us. And then finally, the, the interactive REPL. I think this, this ability to do interactive data exploration is one of the unique things to Spark, and we couldn't have done that without, without the Scala REPL. 
Uh, but even more than that, I think Scala really helps us to reduce the amount of complexity for the developers who are building the system. So this is a comparison of a bunch of different big data tools. This is the non-test, non-example, non-comment source lines of code in, in the projects. And as you can see, Spark is quite a bit smaller in terms of just the, the number of lines of code, the, the amount of complexity that's going to be there compared to really any of the other systems, especially MapReduce, which is, I, I would say, kind of the most, the most analogous system on this chart. Um, but I think what makes Spark special is we've also been able to create all of these very useful primitives which allow us to recreate some of these other systems on top of the, the common Spark computation engine. So, you know, if, for example, you want to do something like streaming, you can pull in Spark Streaming, and that's only kind of, you know, three, four thousand more lines of code. Um, if you want to do SQL, you can pull in Spark SQL, and that's only another, I think, 10,000 lines of code. Um, and then if you want to do some kind of very fast graph processing, you can actually also do that and pull in GraphX. And so still, even after adding all of these other components, which, you, which kind of replace many of these other big data systems, Spark still is significantly less complex for the developers to work on. And I think this has a significant impact in our community. So Spark is one of the largest open source projects in big data. We actually have 150 developers who have contributed to the project at this point from over 30 companies. And in the past year, we actually started dwarfing Hadoop in the, in the number of uh, uh, contributions that we're getting from, from various members of the community, which I think is, is actually pretty exciting. And I think this, this very simple code base that is easy to contribute to is kind of one of the, the big reasons that is driving this. And this has kind of steadily been increasing over time. So uh, back when we released Spark 1.06, uh, this was actually just a, a research project at UC Berkeley. Uh, but since then, things have continued to, uh, to increase. So you know, although I said that was the, the total number of contrib contributors in the last slide, even just for our last release, we had over 110 contributors to the project. Uh, one thing I want to say, though, is kind of a word of caution. You know, with the great power of Scala, it's very easy to alienate your users and developers if you're not careful about it. And one of the things that the Spark project does is we have very strict uh, project coding guidelines that try to keep the, the system, both, both from a user standpoint and from a contributor standpoint, approachable to people who are just, just starting to learn Scala. So for example, we disallow relative imports because that really confuses Java people. Um, we try to minimize infix function use because that, that can be kind of difficult to read for people who are coming from a land where you always have to call dot on your methods. And another key thing is we're pretty, pretty militant about creating Java and Python wrappers for all of our APIs. Nobody should ever have to say uh, dot module dollar sign in order to use our system from, from Java. So that's kind of a, a high level overview of the Spark system, but now let's, let's dive into what I'm actually here to talk about today, Spark SQL. Uh, Spark SQL is one of the newest components of the Spark stack. Um, I actually just started programming it about five months ago, um, and it was part of our 1.0 release. It's an alpha component in, in the most recent release of Spark. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the, the Spark ecosystem, you might be asking, what about Shark? Shark was another system that allowed you to run SQL commands on top of Spark, um, and there's kind of a couple of key differences here. Uh, when, when we originally built the Shark system back at the AMP lab at UC Berkeley, what we did was we actually took the Hive, which is the, another Apache system for running SQL queries on top of MapReduce, and we just ripped out the back end and replaced that with Spark. So instead of producing MapReduce jobs, it produced Spark jobs. Um, but the key problems here was there was really limited integration with Spark programs. It was very difficult to go back and forth between RDDs and relations. Um, and often SQL is not enough for, for what you want to compute. And I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit more uh, later about how we make that easier. And then another key problem is the Hive Optimizer was not designed for the Spark execution engine. The Hive Optimizer spends a lot of time trying to do things like cram as many things as possible into a map task. Um, but since we have a general computation DAG engine, uh, we, don't, we don't need that anymore. Spark can actually figure those things out on its own. Um, so what we did with Spark SQL was we reused the best parts of Shark. We took all of the code for interacting with hives. You can kind of get data out of, the, out of your existing data warehouses. We took the in-memory columnar storage code, and then we completely rewrote the rest from scratch. And so what we're adding here is an optimizer that is natively aware of the RDD abstraction, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later, later in the talk. And we also added these rich language interfaces, which lets you work with SQL and RDDs in Scala and Python and Java, uh, kind of going back and forth seamlessly. So in terms of components, uh, Spark SQL is really, is really broken down into to three that kind of have a linear dependency on each other. 
Um, at the top is the Catalyst Optimizer. And this is really where I think most of the cool Scala things are. So I'm going I'm to focus on that part later in the talk. Um, but this is really actually a Spark agnostic uh, engine for representing both relational algebra and expressions. So things you know, like A plus B or sum of A. Um, and then a, an engine for doing kind of, once again, like uh, implementation agnostic query optimizations. Uh, so I'll talk about that more, but things like filter pushdown or reordering joins. Um, so, you know, this part actually Catalyst has only a dependency on, on Scala and not on Spark. Um, but then the Spark SQL core pulls in Catalyst. And what it does is it's able to take these, these kind of logical relational expressions and compile them down to queries that we can actually execute as RDDs on, on the Spark computation engine. It also provides support for reading a bunch of different data sources in as RDDs. Uh, so we support Parquet and JSON. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. Um, and then finally, we have kind of a third module, which is kind of a, an add-on that gives you the ability to read data that's stored in Hive. Uh, and and I'll, I'll go into that also in the future. So one of the key ideas here uh, of Spark SQL is that we want to add schema to RDDs. We want to know the names and data types of all of the, the elements inside of a, a single item in your collection. Um, so whereas with Spark, you're kind of doing these opaque functional transformations on these opaque objects. Uh, so you know, Spark cannot see inside of this user object to, to figure out which elements you're reading, which ones it actually needs to ship. It has to serialize this entire user object and ship it around the cluster. We also, all of these, these functional transformations, while they're purely functional, which kind of gives us a lot of fault tolerance benefits, um, they're opaque to us as well. So we can't see, is it, is it safe to move them around, for example? And so what SQL plus schema RDDs does is it gives us declarative transformations on partition collections of tuples. So we can actually break up this user object into its components. We can understand the data types of each of those fields. And instead of you telling us you know, exactly how to perform the computation, you tell us what computation you want to do, and the optimizer figures out the most efficient way to do it. And I think a key thing here is this is not an either or situation. We want to make it very easy to go back and forth. When you're doing something like a join or an aggregation, you should be able to express it in SQL. Uh, when you're doing something that's difficult to express in SQL, you should be able to immediately drop back to Scala and express it, express it in that way. So let's start looking at some code. How, how would you actually use Spark SQL in a real system? So uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with Spark, uh, you know, at the top of every Spark program, you create a Spark context. And this is kind of your, your window into the Spark cluster. This is how, how you perform actions on the Spark cluster. It's aware of all of the workers and kind of other things like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a SQL context which just wraps around this Spark context and gives us the optimizer and the, the catalog and kind of all of the things that we need to do richer relational semantics. Um, a kind of a cool Scala thing is you can then import the SQL context, and what that does is it gives you implicit conversions that will seamlessly turn your RDDs into schema RDDs. So let's see, let's see how that actually looks in a real system. Uh, so let's say we have an example data set here. Uh, so this is just going to be a text file, comma separated, filled with people's names and ages. So we've got a couple of examples here. Um, so now we, we want to take this text file and we want to actually turn it into a table. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to define your schema. And one of the kind of key themes here is this language integration that I've been talking about. Uh, so to define schema, you don't do a create table statement, although you can using the, the Hive semantics if you want to. Um, all you need to do is actually create a case class um, that has the, the, the data types that you want to store in your table. Um, these case classes, this is a pretty simple one in this example, uh, but you can actually nest these. You can have case classes within case classes, and we create nested structures. Uh, you can also put arrays into them or maps, and, and we support kind of doing SQL operations on even this kind of non-first normal form data. Um, once, we've, once we've created the schema, then what we want to do is we actually want to create an RDD and, and do some processing on it. So we're going to go back to our, our handy text file, which is going to load load in all of these people. Uh, one, one kind of key thing about all of the examples I'm going to go through here, if you download Spark from our website, you can actually run all of these kind of just right away. All the data is there. Um, uh, just bring up a Spark shell uh, on, on your laptop. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to load in this text file. We're going to split it by the comma. And then we're going to put the different elements into this case class that we've created. So at this point, people is now a standard RDD, but it's an RDD of case classes. And since this RDD contains, contains case classes, there's actually an implicit conversion uh, that allows us to call the register as table method. 
So as soon as you call register as table, the Scala compiler is going to give us a type tag. And from that type tag, we're going to infer the schema of your table. We're actually going to convert this kind of uh, collection of objects into a columnar representation uh, uh, that's that much closer to a relation. And now we're going to be able to reference it as people in, in SQL queries. So once we've registered it, now, now we can actually just run kind of standard SQL queries on it. So basically using the SQL command, which also comes from, from the SQL context, we can you know, pull out the name of all of the people who are in between the ages of 13 and 19. So just like all of the other Spark operations, this, is, this SQL command is going to return an RDD. In this case, it's going to be an RDD of rows that contain the names of the people who match this query. And just like uh, everything else in Spark, this is a lazy transformation, so no, no work has actually been done at this point. And kind of the cool thing is schema RDDs are still RDDs, so I can immediately go back to kind of my more map reduce functional style of programming, and I can do a, a map on, on this result of SQL queries. And the data is still spread out across the cluster, so this map operation is going to happen in parallel. And it's not until I call collect to actually bring all of the results back to me that anything's actually going to occur on the cluster. Um, if you're not a big fan of SQL, you can actually also query using a, a Scala DSL. So basically, if we take this exact same query from the slide before, you can actually represent this as a, a set of function calls. So what we have here is we have a symbol, for those of you who aren't familiar with this kind of lesser known Scala feature. And there's a set of implicit conversion on symbols such that if you use a symbol in a comparison, it becomes an expression, which we can then evaluate on the cluster. So this is, this is exactly equivalent. And this is going to go through the exact same execution path. There's no performance difference between writing in the DSL versus writing in, in SQL other than, you know, maybe we don't have to do a little bit of SQL parsing. So, I, you know, I talked a lot about caching early on, but what does it mean to do caching in Spark SQL? It turns out because of all of the extra schema information that we have, it's actually quite a bit more efficient to cache data in Spark SQL. So, you know, even if you're not using any of the relational semantics that are provided, it actually sometimes makes sense to put your data into Spark SQL because of this kind of efficient columnar storage format that we have. Um, so Spark SQL can cache tables using this, this in-memory columnar format. So that means when you do a query, we're only going to scan the columns that you need to. So if your memory bandwidth limited, uh, there's kind of quite a bit less, uh, less reading going on there. But the key is there's going to be significantly fewer allocated objects. So when you say dot .cache in a Spark program, what you're actually doing is keeping all of those individual objects on the heap in all of the JVMs spread out across your cluster, which you have, if you have a very large data set can eventually lead to GC issues. In this case, what we do is per partition, per column, we actually create a giant byte buffer that holds all of the elements in, in that partition. And so you end up with kind of quite a bit, although you're using the same amount of memory, you end up with quite a, few, uh, quite a bit fewer objects. And so there's actually quite a bit less GC pressure. So I've seen programs that just completely tip over uh, if you try to cache the data set normally, have, have no problem using this, this columnar format. And then the other thing is, because we know the data types, we can actually do pretty efficient like delta encoding or dictionary encoding. And we actually pick the, the best compression based on your data set. And all you need to do to cache something is just call cache table with the name of the table that you want to cache. So we support reading in from a bunch of different data formats. We kind of view schema RDDs as the narrow waste by which you can bring uh, data from other sources into Spark. Um, so we have native support for reading data from Parquet. Uh, this is a columnar storage format that works with Impala and a couple of other big data systems. Um, and the cool thing is you can write data out to Parquet files and the schema is preserved. So you can immediately go back and forth. So if I take a schema RDD and I save it as a Parquet file, when I read it back in, I can immediately, without talking about all of the different data types, register it as a table and start querying it. So no more parsing CSV files and remembering what order things were in and what data types they are. If you use things like Parquet, you kind of get all of that for free. Um, like I said before, we also have Hive support. So this means you can actually take your existing Hive queries and applications, and Spark SQL should be a, a hopefully drop-in replacement for them. So you can use the Hive query language. You can get catalog information from the Hive meta store. So if you've got existing tables created already, um, we've got a table scan operator, which actually supports using Hive certies. So if you've written custom certies for reading things in, uh, you can use that as well. And finally, if you've written UDFs and UDAFs, um, we actually also support using those through wrappers. So you know, any investment that you have in Hive can kind of seamlessly be, be transitioned to Spark SQL. Um, 
one of the cool things is all you need to do to actually read data from Hive is instead of creating a SQL context, you create a Hive context, which is just a subclass of SQL context. And now you get these additional methods, HQL, you can do DDL, you can load data in, um, and then you can actually express queries in kind of this weird version of SQL uh, called HQL. So I talked a lot about going back and forth between kind of uh, you know more functional programming and more relational programming, and here's an example where let's say we've got we're, you know we're some web company and we've got a, a set of actions and a set of users, and based on the, the demographics of those users, we want to predict which users are likely to kind of take actions in the future. And so the nice thing here is kind of the first step is a bunch of data munging in this task. So we want to do this join operation, and we want to pull out only the features that we're interested in. This is a task that SQL is kind of uniquely suited for. You don't want to have to write that efficient join algorithm yourself. Um, so you can express this as SQL. You get an RDD back. And since it's just an RDD, we can immediately drop down into Scala, and we can actually create this kind of efficient double array, this feature vector, which we can then immediately feed into MLlib. So you can kind of seamlessly take the results of your SQL queries and then perform a logistic regression on top of them. Uh, just real quick, we also support Java. This is actually like three lines of Scala that you're seeing here. Um, and we also support Python, um, just in case you're, if you're not a Scala fan. Um, okay, but now let's get into kind of the, the really cool Scala features, I think, uh, of what we're doing with query optimization. So. Uh, you know, first of all, what is query optimization? Uh, so like I said before, SQL is a declarative language. This means that you specify what data to retrieve, but not how to retrieve it. And it's actually up to the system to figure out how to do that retrieval. So we were supposed to pick the, the best execution strategy. So to understand that, let's look at a kind of a very specific example. Um, so this is kind of a relatively uh, kind of Simple query, but you know, not, not written by the, the smartest SQL programmer. There's some inefficiencies here. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to pull out the ID and name from people, and then we're going to filter on it, and then we're going to pull out only the name. But we've got kind of a, a couple of queries here. And so when you parse this, what you're going to end up with is a logical plan that looks like this. Take all of the people, pull out the ID and name, filter out people where the ID is, equal, is only equal to one, and then pull out only the name. So a naive way to do this would just be to do a one-to-one -one mapping of each of these logical operators into a physical operator. So do exactly that. Scan the entire people table, filter out the columns that we don't care about, filter out the tuples that we don't care about, and then again, filter out more columns that we don't care about. But obviously, that's not the fastest way to do this. There were kind of a lot of redundant steps in there. Really, the fastest way to do this would be to realize, well, we've got an index. And what we want to do is just do an index lookup on ID 1 and only return the name. There's no reason to ship any other data over the network. Uh, but how do you write a program that recognizes that pattern? It turns out writing code to optimize all possible patterns is very difficult. Uh, so we take a different tact. Instead, we write simple rules, and each rule is going to make one change to the query plan, hopefully making it faster to execute. And then we're going to take all of these simple rules and put them into a group and run them over and over on the plan until we get to a fixed point, at which point, hopefully, we have kind of a, a much faster query to execute. So how exactly do you go about optimizing a query like this with rules? What do those rules actually look like? So you know, we'll start again with our original plan, and we'll start with a very simple rule. All this rule is going to do is it's going to find filters, and it's going to push them down as far as they can. It's almost always a good idea to filter out data early, because then you don't have to do processing on data that you don't care about. So you know, in this case, all we do is push this filter beneath this project. But now we've got something kind of silly. We've got two projects on top of each other. That's redundant. So let's throw in another rule that combines projections. So you know, no reason to keep the ID around if we're just going to throw it away immediately. And then finally, now we've actually got this much simpler thing. This is kind of a pattern that we can actually recognize, relation, filter, project. And we'll, just, we'll have this other pattern that recognizes index lookups in that case. So I'm not the, the person to think of this. This is actually kind of a, a pretty common pattern in, in databases. Um, there was this idea of optimizer generators, where the idea was optimizers are very hard to write. So instead, let's create a custom language for expressing rules uh, that, that, can be ex uh, that can modify relational trees. And then once you've got this language, uh, what you need to do is actually build a compiler that is able to execute these rules. So I think some of these previous systems, Volcano and Cascades, actually compiled down to C++ code from their domain-specific language for tree representation. 
But the problem here is you have to write this compiler, you have to learn this custom language, and it turns out your language might not be powerful enough. There's some sorts of kind of introspections you want to do on the trees that are, that are difficult to express. So you end up kind of having to invent a, a really complex language. And so what we've done is we've instead embedded this concept inside of Scala. And we've done this through this idea of the tree node library. So we realize that many of the different concepts in our system could be expressed as trees. So we've got logical plans, we've got physical plans, we've got expressions, and tree node is just a, a, a base class that you can mix into all of these different types of trees. And what tree node does is it gives you standard collection functionality, so things like for each, map, collect, um, but it also gives you this transform function. And what this does is it allows you to do recursive modification of tree fragments that match some pattern. And then we also get a lot of light, nice debugging support, pretty printing, splicing of trees together when you're debugging, et cetera. So let's dive in a little bit more to these tree transformations. So when you do a tree transformation, you express it as a partial function from one tree to another tree. And basically what you're gonna do then is it's gonna, it's gonna follow this pretty standard pattern. It's gonna walk the tree, and if the function does apply to an operator, we're going to replace that part of the tree with the result of your function. If the function does not apply, then what the tree node library does, it kind of seamlessly walks through. So this way, you don't have to write a lot of special classes to skip over all of the operators you don't care about, which is kind of the, the typical visitor pattern way of implementing something like this. And then finally, if the, tra the transformation is then applied recursively to all of the children. So we kind of walk down the tree and then reassemble it, taking care of all of the mu immutability guarantees we want to keep uh, uh, about these trees. So how do you actually write a rule as a tree transformation. So once again, we're back to kind of our, our original query plan here. And let's say we want to do this, this filter pushdown rule. So there's going to be a couple of steps. First, we're going to find the filters that are on top of projections. Then we're going to check to see if it's safe to push this filter down. So the question here is, can this condition be evaluated underneath this projection, or does it require some value that is computed inside of the projection? And then finally, if it is safe, let's switch the order of those two. So the nice thing is, you know, other systems do this, but they end up being fairly complex. There's a lot of type checks and casts and how many children do I have? And then you have to kind of rewrite the tree manually. In Scala, you can do this in about three lines of code. Um, so basically what we have here is uh, we've got the tree and then we call the transform function, passing it this, this partial function. And what this pattern matching gives us the ability to, to find this filter on top of a project. So we want to find only filters where the child is a project, and then we want to bind some variables here so we get the grandchild and the actual filter and the project. We want to check to see if it's safe to evaluate this filter without the results of the project. So all of the references that are required for evaluation, we want to make sure that they're a subset of the things that the grandchild is producing, even without the projection. And then finally, we want to switch the order. So you can see we're using a lot of Scala language features to make this more powerful and concise. We're using pattern matching, we're using the collections library, and we're using copy constructors. So, okay, so now we've, now we've done a bunch of uh, transformations on the trees. We've made really efficient, uh, a really efficient logical plan, but now we actually need to evaluate it. So let's talk about how you do efficient expression evaluation on top of the JVM. So it turns out doing interpreted evaluation is incredibly slow. Uh, even more so on the JVM and in other systems. And this is because you have virtual function calls, you're constantly branching to see what type of expression you're working on because you need to support addition on integers and doubles and booleans, all sorts of things. Um, you need to support object creation, uh, or you need to, you have a lot of object creation because you're constantly boxing because you don't know the data types ahead of time. And then you're actually paying a memory price in addition to an allocation and deallocation price uh, for, for these box primitives. So to kind of understand that, let's look at a really simple example, uh, A plus B. Um, if I actually want to evaluate this, I'm going to create this expression tree. To evaluate it, I'm going to have a virtual function call to adds evaluate function, which is then going to make another virtual function call to A, which is going to return a boxed integer, which is going to make another, and then we're going to make another virtual function call, return another boxed integer, actually do the work that we want to do, here's the fast part, and then return another boxed integer. So that was incredibly inefficient. We allocated three objects, we had three virtual function calls. Um, fortunately, Scala gives us a much better way to do this using runtime reflection, which I think is actually the, the talk that is, is at the same time as this one. Oop, sorry. 
And so what we're using here is we're using this really cool new feature in, in Scala 2.11 that you can actually also access in Scala 2.10 called runtime reflection, where I can actually dynamically generate Scala ASTs at runtime and then compile them down to bytecode. So instead of interpreting that, I can actually create this function called generate code, which takes in the expression and does pattern matching. If it's an attribute, we're just going to create Scala code that pulls the int out based on the ordinal for that attribute. So, you know, pull out column number one from my input. By putting Q here, I'm telling the Scala compiler that this isn't a string, this is a quasi quote, so this is actually Scala code. So what you're getting back is a Scala AST, which you can throw at the compiler and get back a class at runtime. And, you know, then for the same thing for add, add is actually just going to recurse. We can use interpolation here and actually splice in code from other, other uh, calls to this function. And then we can actually do the work here. So instead of that incredibly inefficient interpretation that we just talked about, what you end up with is basically native Scala code like this that uh, has fewer function calls and operates only on primitives. Um, so it turns out this is actually a huge win in terms of performance. Um, you know, if we, if we look at kind of the interpreted evaluation, so this is the time that it takes to run A plus A plus A over a billion integers. Interpreted evaluation is pretty slow. Um, if I write this by hand, so I sit down and I write an RDD that uses all of the primitives, uses integers and, and simple addition, I can get it pretty fast. And with Scala Reflection, I can actually make it almost exactly as fast, which is, which is pretty cool, because now the programmer doesn't have to do any work. The, the, the uh, query optimizer can actually kind of take care of all of that for them. Uh, it turns out this actually you know, isn't, works for things other than just toy examples. Uh, this is running our system on TPCDS. This is the Transaction Processing Council's decision support benchmark. So you basically think uh, giant joins with aggregations over, I think it's like terabytes of data. And basically what you can see here is that through our, our better optimization to the RDD model and through our increased code generation, um, you know, this shark is also running on top of Sparks. It's like a, a pretty head-to-head -head comparison. We're actually able to be significantly faster. Uh, for some of the queries that have more complicated expression evaluation, we're actually eight times faster. So this is basically the, the Scala compiler is, is a huge win here for us. And the nice thing here is really what this is, is this is code generation made simple. Uh, so we're not the only ones to do code generation in our SQL system. This is a pretty standard trick. Uh, other systems like Impala and Drill do this as well. But because of Scala reflection and quasi quotes, this wasn't some major system overhaul or something that we designed into the system uh, from the beginning. This is actually a project that I did over two weekends and that gave us you know, incredible speed ups. Um, and really actually uh, overall, it was about a thousand lines of code to add pretty general expression uh, uh, generation to, to our system. So that's kind of an overview of, of, of Spark SQL and the optimizer and kind of how we use Scala. I want to talk a little bit about some things that we're, we're working on that we haven't got working yet, but that I'm actually pretty excited about. This is a joint work with a bunch of people from EPFL and TypeSafe. Um, kind of one of the problems with the system right now, it's very seamless to take your Scala data and get it into SQL. But when you pull it out of SQL, uh, the, the type system has no idea what's coming out. And so there, there's some messiness here as a result. So kind of these are some of the places that a programmer could make a mistake when they're writing this code. So you know, I'm registering this string and then I'm referencing this string here. If I misspell that, um, you know, the compiler has no idea and won't tell me until runtime that there's a problem. Kind of the other big problem is I have to tell it the data type and if I get that wrong, I'm going to get a class cast exception at runtime. I have to remember what the ordinal is. So if I add in another column here, that's actually going to break it. So we're kind of violating data independence, one of the tenets of the relational model. Um, so you can see there's kind of a bunch of problems here. What we really want to do is something uh, that looks a much, much more like this. Uh, so, you know, basically, honest, you can just use a, a kind of similar trick to the quasi quotes um, to, to run the query. You can actually just reference RDDs through interpolation within the thing. And, and then uh, the results actually come out as type safe objects where we know the names and types of the columns. Um, so, you know, this is something we're, we're kind of working on, but, you know, hopefully something we'll be able to put in into a future feature. So, uh, if you want to, you know, if you're excited about this, if you want to try it out, uh, you should check out spark.apache.org. We've got videos and tutorials on using Spark. Uh, you can actually, if you're already running CDH on your cluster, this is the, the Cloudera Hadoop distribution. There's a package uh, that you can get from them to, to run Spark on your existing cluster. And I think really the coolest thing about Spark is it's really easy to run on your laptop. If you, if you just check out the, the project, you can boot up the Spark shell and use it even without a cluster, uh, write some programs there, and then they kind of trivially scale up when you actually have big data 
complicated to deal with. Um, and we've also got a bunch of free talks and, and training exercises available at the, the Spark Summit website as well. Uh, so, you know, in, in conclusion, Spark is kind of this, this unified stack for doing big data processing. Whether you want to do kind of low-level MapReduce jobs, you want to use high-level machine learning functions, or you even want to do things like SQL or stream processing, you can do all of this within the Spark engine. And, you know, I think a lot of the, the cool features and the developer friendliness here came from the Scala language. Um, you know, if you'd like to use more or learn more, uh, check us out. We have a, a Spark Summit coming up in two weeks back in San Francisco. Um, and that's my talk. I think there's a little time for questions, if anybody has any. Yeah? Yeah, totally. So, so TreeNode is part of Catalyst, and kind of one of the key design decisions of Catalyst was to have no dependencies on anything other than the Scala compiler. Uh, so, if you're interested in trying out the TreeNode, just you can you can just depend on the, the Catalyst submodule of Spark. Yes. Ah, so uh, what we actually do is we fork out to the C version of Python. So if you've got native libraries like NumPy, you can use those with Spark as well. Yes? Uh, we don't do that yet. <laughs> yeah, we don't. Uh, basically, I th yeah, we, that's, that's a hard problem. Um, it turns out there's so much low-hanging fruit in doing heuristic optimizations that you can actually do pretty good without that. Um, I would love to talk more offline about how we should do that correctly. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, that's a good question. I mean, if, if you don't already have, so the question was, I, I should be repeating the question. Um, if you are in a greenfield de deployment of Spark SQL, which backend should you use? Um, so I mean, basically, I, one of the nice things is you don't have to pick one or the other. Um, if you have no data in Hive, uh, you may still want to use the Hive context because our HQL implementation is much more complete than our SQL implementation. Uh, our SQL parser was actually written by me once again in a weekend using Scala parser combinator, so it's not very complete, whereas we actually support basically the whole subset of HQL. So I would say, you know, for, for a greenfield deployment, kind of the, the fastest to get started would be to use the Hive context and use HQL to express your queries. Uh, but there's no need to spin up a Hive Metastore and go through all that work. I would just store your data as Parquet or something like that. Turns out Parquet is actually quite a bit faster than most of the Hive certies. Any other questions? Yes. So you're, you're talking about using the specialized annotation. We have not tried that. Uh, that would be interesting, although I, you know, I'm not sure if that would save us. We, I'd love to talk more about whether or not that would be enough. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, we should definitely talk more offline. Um, and yeah. Ah, that's a good question. I, I don't think so. Um, I think, uh, you know, kind of CDH's story for SQL is Impala. Um, that said, Spark's, like, the nice thing about Spark libraries is they are kind of, you can, you can just kind of bring them with you. So one of the things that we've done is we've had existing systems that did not install one of the components, and all you need is the Spark SQL jar file to, to use Spark SQL on the system. So I think there should be no problem using Spark SQL on CDH. I just don't think it'll come prepackaged. Um, and if you have problems doing that, please email the user list. We would love to help you get that working. Um, I could probably take a couple, is we out of time? Okay, so I think we're out of time, so please come and talk to me if you have more questions. Thanks.